You are listening to episode 29 of the R Podcast. everybody. Welcome to episode 29 of the Yard Podcast. I am your host, Eric Nance, and as always, I am very happy to have you listening to this episode. Um, I know there's a lot of choices to choose from <laughs> in your spare time with listening to podcasts, so I much appreciate you taking the time to download this episode. So I am very happy um, to talk to you about my recent experience for the first time attending an R Unconference. I have been wanting to do this for a long time, and opportunity just kind of fell um, with good luck and being near a place where I'm located to be able to attend one of these. So I am going to get to those uh, very quickly here. Um, Right off the top, just want to mention that if you're new to the show, um, you can find all the past episodes on our website at r-podcast.org. And there are lots of ways where you can not only get the old episodes, but also find the best ways to contact me, either for email or through the contact form on on the site. And I'm going to be um, expanding the content uh, probably pretty sooner than later. Um, I've got the big plans in the works, and some of that might be announced pretty soon. Um, Can't wait to tell you all about that. But um, for this episode, again, I want to kind of do a a deep dive into my experience attending the Chicago R Unconference. This took place in, of course, Chicago earlier this month, uh, March 9th through 10th, so to speak, on a weekend. And I I was hoping to get this uh, wrap-up out to all of you sooner, but then I got saddled with a post-conference little cold there and had to recover a bit, but now everything's back to normal. Um, So I have heard about on conferences before, but I've only heard, you know, obviously the great things people would say in particular about the R open Sci on conferences that have taken place both here in the United States and also uh, overseas, like in Australia. And actually when um, Nick Tierney, former uh, guest of the show and also podcast host, uh, incredibly curious, he and his co-host did a great deep dive on the um, R Open Sci on or OZ Unconf, sorry, I had to get the name right. Um, and they did a great kind of roundup of their experience. And I was, admittedly, after hearing that, first I was jealous of not being able to attend one of those, and I, it just really gave me the, the the itch to try going to one of these. So one night, um, scraping kind of the R Stats hashtag on Twitter, I see. Um, Angela Lee give a little shout out post about the Chicago R Unconference. And I'm thinking, oh, this sounds fun. It's within driving distance of where I'm located. And I've always wanted to go to one of these. So they opened up applications. I submitted one and I wasn't sure if I would get accepted because uh, I'll get to some of those reasons in a little bit. But luckily they took me. So um, I was very excited for that. And Angela actually gave us a a nice opportunity to have a short video call with her about a week or so before the before the event just to help get any questions answered and get kind of insights from us on what we were hoping to achieve and I was fortunate to jump on that and I've seen Angela's name before and apparently she was also at the R Studio on conference but because that place is so massively uh, busy and heavily populated we never had a chance to cross paths there but um, what a what a delightful, welcoming, uh, extremely nice uh, uh, person she is. She really helped me feel at ease with, admittedly, I was kind of a bit nervous about attending this because uh, I wasn't sure what I could do to help, so to speak. And we talked about some various ideas. And that conversation was quite helpful because it gave me kind of the nudge to figure out which project I wanted to work on. But um, she was, you know, very welcoming again and able to, listen to what I had to say and and she really made me feel like this is going to be a great event so 
after that video call, I uh, kept my eye on the GitHub issue tracker, and then I kind of, you know, every every idea is really good. There's never a bad idea at these things, and I wanted to. There was one in particular that kind of had a good mix of what I felt was some cool infrastructure ideas and even uh, helping with some shiny related items. So I went on that, and now come to get to that project in a little bit, and. I thought that was some good preparation beforehand, and um, now I'll tell you a bit about the the event itself. So I got there the night before, and like I said, it was in driving distance, so it was a, a you know, about three three and a half hour drive. That could be a lot worse. No snow this time, so just cruising on the highway, listening to other podcasts about data science and Linux to pass the time. And what what was really cool about this is my. Um, my colleague, actually my teammate at work and former guest of this show, uh, Will Landau, also attended this event. Um, those of you who have listened to the back catalog know that he was on, I believe, episode 22 to talk about the early days of his immensely successful, powerful, and frankly, supremely awesome package called Drake. We'll get to that in a little bit. But one little nice nugget about this is that Will actually attended the University of Chicago, which is where the con- the unconference is being held. He went there as an undergraduate student. So I was able to get a little recap of the history of the university. He was able to show me around a little bit. And frankly, it was nice not to have to walk alone to the, <laughs> to the hotel and back. So, But it was, it was really cool to, to get here his experiences. And um, Will was always such a personable and very welcoming guy as well. So that was good to get that little history and we had a nice little uh, mixer dinner the night before the actual event um, I got to meet Angela in person at that one along with a few of the other attendees just to get to unwind have a good little relaxing uh, time there and then we get to the the main event as I say um, so first I'll mention that the conference was organized by Angela Lee who um uh, it depends on who you ask and the organizers. Her fellow organizers said she did such immense work for this, and I, I think all three of them did. But, yeah, she really helped steer the ship right, and I, from what I heard, she went above and beyond and did everything she possibly could to make this a great experience, and I, I'd say she, she nailed it. Alex Hayes is one of the co-organizers, and he um, also maintains the broom package, which was actually one of the projects that we'll talk about in a little bit. And then the the third um, organizer was uh, Emily Reederer. Um, she actually gave a talk um, a couple of years ago at our studio conf. Really awesome talk about using the tidyverse or some of the kind of financial data and internal processes from where she worked. And I've so I've seen her I've seen her talk before, but she's really awesome to talk to as well. Um, everything was, you know, set up really well, had a nice breakfast that first morning, and then taking a, a bit of a page out of some of the R Open Sci on conferences, they decided to have a little kind of get to know each other, um, um, social activity. And they would ask us a few questions and they would have one side of the hallway where you answer one way and then another side for the other answer. And kind of in the middle is if you're kind of undecided or don't know which one to choose. So that was all good and fun. And then the third question of that little exercise was something along the lines of where do you feel like you know where you fit in the R community as a whole? It was funny. I I thought about this and I thought there may be people that think I know where I fit, but I personally not sure if I know where I fit at that time. Um, the reason I kind of say in the middle of this room uh, or in this hallway during, during that, uh, that particular question was I've been doing what I can to share my ideas about how you can use R, you know, in a lot of innovative ways. And this podcast really is meant, you know, for both the, the new users out there and the more experienced users. But I know that when I was first starting to learn, learn this awesome language, there, uh, we're going back in time, folks. There wasn't a lot of good stuff out there in terms of resources in the general web. And to ask somebody to read the uh, R uh, kind of manual that's built in, I mean, of course, it's awesome, but good luck if you're a first-time user. I'll just say that. But I feel like I've had 
Yeah, I don't know how to say this. I probably mentioned it a bit in previous episodes. I've had a bit of an internal struggle with how do I start sharing some of the cool ways that I've been using R, what I've learned at the uh, quote day job without destroying confidentiality or getting getting fired, so to speak. Um, and I thought, well, what what can I do? And so when this on conference came around, I thought, well, this is a good chance to try a project that's out in the open and see what I can accomplish. And hopefully that spurs on some new ideas, new collaborations, and just um, getting getting involved and helping others. So at that time when I thought about staying in the middle, yeah, I don't know where I fit at that time, but I think this experience and some other ideas I have for the future, I'll finally start to identify kind of where I fit in this big picture. But it's not just about me personally, what I feel. I want to help others along the way. So that was a a good little um, mini uh, kind of question there to get me thinking about where do I want to go in the future? But more importantly, how do I want to help others that are coming up, say, learning R for the first time or trying to use it at work or for personal projects? What what can I do to help out? So this, this that was a good way to kind of get my motivation going if it wasn't there already, but kind of take it a step further. So, so yeah, then we, it's time to dive into stuff, right? It's time to dive into projects. And they had um, kind of the, there were, I would say, kind of project leaders that were kind of established by putting issues on the GitHub tracker. And they each had a time to kind of introduce their project and have kind of little tables around the room where everybody could sit if they wanted to work on that. And, I'll get to the one that I ended up sitting on a little bit, but I want to kind of turn and go through a few of these that I, even though I wasn't directly involved, I was able to kind of get some good conversations about their, about what they were working on and see the impact of them when we had the wrap up. So up first, I want to introduce you to Kunishka Misra, who is going to talk to you about the foot rule R package. Hi, uh, my name is Kanishk Misra, and I'm a first-year PhD student at Purdue University. Uh, so we're here in the, sh- in the Chicago and Conference working on a package called FootRuler, package name tentative for now. Um, the goal of this package is to uh, measure the quality of generated texts based on a given ref- uh, set of res- uh, references, usually by human annotated examples. So one immediate use case here is machine translation, where you have, um, where you are trying to translate French to English, and you have a bunch of human generated or human annotated French to English translations. So they're bilingual people, and they they know French and English, and they take for each given French line, they generate the English line, and then you have a system that generates. Uh, English translations of French text as well. So you want to compare the generated text of the English of that system to uh, the the given references from the humans. And there are a bunch of good, well-defined collection of metrics that's already been uh, proposed in literature. Cool. So what we're trying to do. So the group is right now me. I'm Kanishk. Uh, there's Will Bonnell. Uh, then there's Catherine Simeone, um, Mauro Lapore and Joshua uh, Goldberg. So let's see how how this goes. Yeah, thank you so much. So I am really impressed with what that group accomplished. Um, Kanishka is a very bright, bright student. I I think he's going to be one of the the rising stars in this community. Um, He knows so much, you know, as a novice to kind of machine uh, textual uh, analyses, um, I don't have a lot of prior knowledge on that, but he was very practical on how he explained things to me as he was having kind of wrapping up his summaries. And I think this this package is going to be a huge benefit to the, the textual analysis community. Um, I actually, in for my, my personal life, uh, my wife is originally from a different country, so I am trying to learn a different language. But I think it's in this age of technology where we're, when we're relying on so many other kind of automated mechanisms, whether it's things like Google Translate or other um, machine algorithms to generate text based on, you know, human voice or human written words, I think it's really important that we have these kind of packages like 
foot rule are to benchmark these ideas and give us a practical kind of readout of how how reliable some of these algorithms are. So I'm going to keep an eye on this. And yeah, the, the, foot, the package name may change down the road, but I thought that group did an excellent job. They had some kind of some pretty hairy moments of debugging something. And I remember that everybody was so excited when they finally solved the problem, but everybody in that group really contributed nicely. Um, they also got some great advice from Maru of Lepore. And let me just say, if I'm mispronouncing all of your names, I am deeply sorry. I'm just terrible at pronouncing names. <laughs> I'm trying my best. Um, but Maru really helped them out with how do you organize a package effectively, how do you take advantage of automated testing and set it up for success later on? So I've, I've heard nothing but great things of what that group accomplished. And like I said, I think it's going to be a space to watch as we look at this speech recognition, text recognition, uh, translation um, analyses going forward. So let's now turn it over to updates for the Drake package. Cool. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Ben Listig. Uh, I'm working with Will on sort of do, using a simple simulation uh, I wrote a while ago on a fixed choice designs and social networks, and sort of examining how uh, examining how like a network under a fixed choice design differs from the true sort of data generating process of like the real network of interest, and uh, using Drake to sort of automate that workflow, or not automate, but improve that sort of workflow simulation workflow. Cool. You want to say something, buddy? <laughs> this is Will. I'm just going to say how grateful I am with, uh, for the interest that people are showing in this in this project and exchanging ideas in general. Um, ben has a has a interesting, highly motivating application of of Drake. It ex illustrates the problem that it's trying to solve with the large computation time and uh, real research area. It's been extremely helpful to learn. So I'm really happy to see the progress that was made with, with this project. Um, now, of course, I have a little insider knowledge on some of this. since I, Like I mentioned, I'm on the same team as Will, the day job. But um, Will has been looking for something like this for a very long time. He has been wanting to share more use cases of Drake that aren't just kind of these basic examples. But what would we do in real practice to help to help with the vision of automated, reproducible, and efficient analyses that the Drake workflow um, really offers. And so Ben's progress on, on this example for social science research is just one huge step in that direction. But he, the, I'd heard that the, the runtime and the execution time of carrying out the the algorithms or the analyses that Ben was running were very time consuming. So Drake is going to be an absolutely huge help for that. And that example is going to be a, a great showcase in the future. And we'll have links to that example in, in the show notes if you want to check that out. Um, so there were others involved with the project. Um, TJ Marr, um, he helped uh, fix a lot of issues in Drake itself. And now he is part of the official uh, list of Drake contributors. And he's going to try and adopt some of his current research, uh, behavioral research projects to, to use Drake in the future. Um, there was also some great contributions from a couple other people that looked at adding links to guidances in, in the manual um, and making sure how, how can Drake even be used with things like TensorFlow, which I have not dived into personally, but I know that's a huge, huge, um, huge project. And a lot of traction in the deep learning community. So, and then this is real, I thought this was really ambitious, but somehow he pulled it off. Will had successfully released an update to Drake, now version seven, on CRAN live on the last day of the, on the, con of the on conference. I did not know what to expect. You know, I'm, I tried to be optimistic, but I was like, Ooh, if I have such a hard time with demos, usually I don't know what's going to happen here. But boy, by golly, he, he pulled it off and everything was set to go. But all the contributions were very valuable. And he's been wanting to get this update out for a long time. because There's a lot of under the hood enhancements to Drake that you'll want to check out the release notes for that. Uh, again, it's Drake version 7. And if you weren't aware, this is part of the R open side group now. And 
has just been hugely helpful for the traction of Drake going forward. So I know even speaking to Will, walking back from this event, he is, this was everything he could have hoped for and more. So kudos to Will and the rest of the team for enhancing Drake for version 7. That was supremely good. And next, let's hear from Chase Clark about Electric Shine. Yeah, I'm Chase Clark, and we are trying to make a R package to automate creating Electron apps, so desktop applications, out of Shiny apps for distribution to the world. Very cool. How's it going so far? Uh, It's going great. (laughs) Just trying to remember where we left off on the package and get started back into developing it. So this was quite an interesting endeavor and frankly not an easy one. Um, I've actually had to explore using this Electron framework with Shiny for what was going to be, it was a pretty important work project and for circumstances ended up not going well in that direction, but that's that's a different story. But um, for those that aren't aware, um, and Chase mentioned it, but Electron is a way that you can wrap kind of a web type application based in most likely JavaScript into an executable that you can install on the majority of platforms out there, whether it's uh, Windows, Mac OS, or, or Linux. Um, but making these, especially if you don't have a lot of training in software development or web technologies, is not for the faint of heart. So Ideally, we can deploy a Shiny app on things like Shiny Server or Shiny Apps I.O. or whatever if you have access to spin up one of these servers yourself, but that's not always the case. So I'm all for um, teams looking at different methods of deployment to meet the needs of their particular organization if the, the, mo- if the more robust and tried and true methods just for whatever reason are not available. Um, so I, I remember when I debugged my explorations of creating an Electron app, it was not easy at all. So hopefully there's going to be lots more great progress on Electric Shine. But there were already some helpful enhancements from this on conference where um, Belinda Chen helped make um, a test to make sure paths that were in the specifications or the, the manifest of these Electron apps were, were correct. And gosh, there's got to be a lot of testing under the hood that's got to be done to make sure this this whole operation works. So I'll be watching that space a bit. But um, yeah, again, great job by Chase and the rest of the team on that project. And there were, you know, even through that effort, there were some that were trying to make like new Shiny apps for testing. And I, it was just so awesome to see people learning Shiny. Again, I'm a huge geek about Shiny, so I'll never uh, turn away from, from, you know, be paying attention to that stuff. So next, um, in terms of summarizing what I was involved with, I think it's a good time to dive into what I was um, supporting, and that's called the Unconf Toolbox. This is quite a meta project, but um, when Angela and I had our video call, she had mentioned that um, they were one of the issues that she had put up was how do we make it easy for others in the future to have the ambition and the motivation to run one of these on conferences, how do we make it easy for them to get started with the right infrastructure, um, the right tools to automate a lot of the mundane processes, just to make sure they can concentrate on getting the event up and running and, you know, all those issues. Let's take away some of the burden of the mundane things, but also bring in automation, bring in state-of-the-art technologies to give give the audience and the organizers a really nice set of resources to follow. So I thought this was a great opportunity to start seeing what I could contribute from a shiny perspective and even general advice about infrastructure. So this actually ended up having multiple efforts within it. In fact, we have a separate GitHub organization just for this Unconf toolbox and last I checked, I think there's at least six, seven, maybe eight repos inside. So there's there's a lot in there. And for two days, I think the rest of the group we we did a we did a terrific job to get that up and running. Lots of pitfalls along the way. <laughs> I'll get to some of that in a little bit, but we we made it. Um, so some of the parts that were involved with this, um, one was made by um, Sam Sam Tinner. Um, she's a postdoc at Iowa State. And fun fact that she is an organizer 
for the upcoming UNCOAST unconference that's occurring on April 14 through 16 in AIM. Uh, I can't remember what city in Iowa, sorry, but it's in Iowa. It's, but if you're been wanting to go to one of these events and you're not on the east or west coast, this is this is an event for for the mid coast or Midwest or central of the country people like us. So if not for just attending the Chicago one, I don't think I can spring to go to two of them two in a row. But hopefully next year I might be able to go to one of these. But so anyway, Sam did a really awesome project. She actually made an automated Twitter bot that retweets any tweets that are found with the unconference hashtag. So I've been, you know, mostly a Twitter consumer, but it's really interesting to see under the hood how one of these bots work because maybe I can leverage one of these for some of my open source work in the future. So um, there was a lot of debugging she had to work through, but, but she was able to make it happen. And so we had a specific hashtag for the Chicago R on conference. And when those tweets went out, this bot would find it and retweet it. So did the job and did it well. So that's just one piece of the picture here. Um, Emily Reederer, um, I mentioned her as one of the organizers for this conference. She was looking at ways that we could create kind of a nice um, template and system for emailing participants. And she was struggling with this initially. Um, I, I wish I had talked to her a bit about my idea sooner, but she was trying to figure out, okay, how do I wrangle these R Markdown templates to do what I want for this email? And it wasn't until the second day that I, it finally dawned on me that we may have this problem solved in the community. So I mentioned to her the Blastula package, which if you listened to a couple episodes ago, um, Rich Ioni, um, software engineer at our studio, he has made this package called Blastula to help make a very attractive um, automated email directly from R. And when I gave her that link, it was like the light bulb went off and now she had a method or a, a tool to accomplish her goal. So she is very excited to see that package. And now we have a system for nicely formatted emails to the uh, unconference participants. So Kudos to Emily for persevering through some hardships in the beginning and, and being able to leverage a great tool from the community to make that happen. And then now we're going to get to the shiny stuff. This is this has always been my wheelhouse lately. Um, the first project in shiny, um, we had Sydney Ardu and Natalie Jorian. Um, Sydney is a researcher in the Cook County Sheriff's Office, and Natalie is a psychometrician at Pearson View. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing that right again. Um, but they worked on some Shiny apps for the application process. So if typically what people will do for these conferences, they'll use something like a Google form or maybe an Office 365 form to send out to participants when they are looking for applications and they'll fill it out and submit it and all that stuff. Well, um, I've always kind of been weary of all these like you know very you know they're usually free services but google's google right i mean it is data and and honestly i just think it's a cool factor to try and do things in R directly <laughs> so they made a very nice web form dynamic web form for all the questions that someone might want to ask of their um you know um, applicants for an unconference and it's really well done they had uh, we were actually able to leverage some ideas from one of Dina Telly's uh, previous posts about doing mimicking a Google form in shiny we had some small issues with like hiding and displaying certain elements and then that's when they were that was kind of towards the end of that that project before we were going to present our findings to the rest of the rest of the young conference participants and they were just trying to figure out why can't we get this div to hide or why can't we get this part to show up or hide and that's when i thought about well maybe there's another way maybe we just use one of dean's other packages called uh, shiny alert just to show them that hey your your submission was successfully received or they missed a certain field that they should have inputted so it goes to show you that you might find a great resource from, say, a few years ago, but you, you, sometimes you have to augment it with some more state-of-the-art solutions. But luckily, we were able to kind of plug that in at the end, and now they have a great, well-functioning web form for that. 
And then uh, Natalie in particular also worked on a Shiny app to review the data from these forms. Now that's an interesting uh, endeavor in that the first key question was, well, we have the Shiny app that's collecting the data. Where in the heck do we put it? So they looked at using Google Drive first, but that did not pan out the way they expected. Or I should say not Google Drive, but Google Sheets. Um, there were some issues getting the sheets to update. They, they tried a lot of different things. Then they ended up, I believe, putting them in Dropbox as uh, just a custom text file from each submission and then kind of wrangling that all together. So there's definitely a good prototype of that solution up there now on, on the GitHub for this Uncomp Toolbox. I think there's some still awesome work that could be done in the future. But again, we're trying to give this kind of cohesive platform of tools that any organizer of these future events can leverage uh, going forward. And now comes the fun one. Well, I mean, they're all fun, but um, the one that I was most involved with, I was able to partner um, with Sharla Gelfand. Um, she's a statistician working in nursing regulation in Toronto, Canada. And fun fact, she also developed Shiny Apps quite a bit um, as, a, as one of the contractors under uh, Tanya Casciarelli, who's been prominent in the Shiny community for a long time, and she runs her own consulting business for developing Shiny apps. So in part, as part of this Uncomp Toolbox kind of proposal that uh, Angela had put out, one of the items was um, a way that we could kind of get a real-time dashboard of the activity in terms of working on issues and closing issues and submitting pull requests um, from these unconference participants to their respective projects that they're working on. Because it's kind of like a, I, mean, I don't know how to say it. I mean, it is like a, it is a true dashboard, right? Um, but it's a real-time one that we wanted to take advantage of some things with the GitHub API to show this in an attractive interface and let users quickly scan through all the current projects and what issues have been opened and closed. So I thought, ooh, this sounds fun. Because it's not only just the app itself, but what service can we tie into to, via the GitHub API to bring this data in and at least close to a real-time fashion. So as Charlotte and I were thinking about this, um, we figured, okay, what framework do we want and how do we wrangle this GitHub API effectively? Well, the good news is that we could leverage um, one of Emily's uh, pra- uh, packages that she made recently um, I believe it's called Project R, and if I don't have that link right, I'll have it in the show notes. Um, but what's nice about this package is that it has these nice um, interfaces or nice wrapper functions to the GitHub API for more of the project management type features, such as downloading issues, um, looking at um, an organization's kind of metadata within a GitHub repo, uh, lots of little nice things like that. So that was a great way to get us started with grabbing the issue data itself and then figuring out, okay, who who submitted the issue? Um, What are the number of comments there? Is it closed or is it open? And things like that. So Shara was really diving deep into the API part of that, and I was starting to tackle, okay, what, what what should this interface look like? So I was able to leverage some uh, fun, a fun project that I worked on right before the conference, or unconference, excuse me. Um, it was actually for the Shiny contest that was recently run by our studio. I had made a Shiny app that was a, 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 a kind of a front end to a new um, set of functions, which is now a package that lets you create Lego mosaic images from a, from a real image that you upload to the interface using a bunch of awesome, awesome functions made by Ryan Tempe. Um, it's now called Brick R, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes, but I have made a, a kind of nice dashboard in front of this for the contest and also just a, a good way to test my kind of shiny skills right before this unconference event. And I used a really awesome UI package called BS4 Dash, which is a way to give you a bootstrap for uh, mechanism um, for a dashboard layout. It uses a, a kind of an updated version of the same framework that Shiny Dashboard uses. It's called Admin LTE, but it uses an updated version of that. 
And I really liked the look of that app that I made before the event. And I thought, well, if we're looking for a dashboard, hey, why not try this? And best of all, I just went through it literally the, the two months before this event. So I started prototyping that and then slowly rolling in uh, Charlotte's code for wrangling the, the GitHub API via the Project R package. And then we started figuring out how do we want to lay this out? What's our, what's our first page look like? How do we make it so users can quickly kind of toggle between the issues? How do we quickly show users what are open and what are closed? And so we, we had a lot of fun making this. And well, the other fun part is, is that I don't usually get a good chance um, to work with another, you know, really proficient, shiny developer side by side and really get a lot accomplished very shortly. And frankly, it was kind of refreshing not to have to coach somebody about, this is how you do a commit, or, well, that reactive went bogus because you forgot the parentheses or things like that. Sharla really knows her stuff. Like, it was really awesome to work with her on this. And we even had a lot of, well, it may not have been fun at the time, but now I'm, I'm laughing about it. We had um, some good um, debugging, I'll say, with regular expressions <laughs> trying to wrangle some of the text from these issues. Um we went in one direction, and then that ended up not being panned out, and then we went in a slightly different direction. But we were also able to kind of talk shop about our philosophies of Shiny development, such as do you try to not use many dependencies at all for your app, or do you take whatever's available to get the job done? As we were first working on this, Charlotte was of the mindset of, no, I'm going to do this in base R. I'm going to just not have a new dependency for it. And I'm thinking, well, you might want to try one of these. But it was good to have that dialogue. I don't, I don't get to have those kind of conversations very much because people are like, well, Eric, you're the one that knows how to do it, so you just make the shots. But it was good to bounce some ideas off of somebody and really share what we learned. So we persevered some pretty gnarly um, regex debugging and also some per map function debugging, but we, we made it work. And... Things really started to come together at the end. We were really, you know, tuned in on this. We were frantically uh, submitting pull requests between us and, and making sure each one was updated. But, man, that was just tons of fun. And we got the dashboard up and running. I had to quickly scramble to get it deployed on the uh, Shiny Apps I.O. service so we could show something in our little presentation at the end there. But we, we got it in. In fact, I think it was around the time that Will was updating Drake on CRAN that I was frantically deciphering access token issues and, and debugging the, the update to Shiny Apps I.O. But we, we got it through, and I was really happy with what this app turned out with in two days, along, of course, like I mentioned, the other apps for the, um, the web form and, and the, the, rating, the, rating, or the rating assessment form. For two days, this is really top-notch stuff in the Shiny ecosystem that we were able to draw from and, and make ourselves. So I hope that's really useful for um, organizers in the future. But, man, what an awesome team to work with. Um, it was just a really cool experience. So actually, Sharla wrote her thoughts about the unconference in general um, and on her blog, and we'll have a, a link to that in the, in the show notes of this episode, and it was a great read. So... Once again, I had immense fun working on this project. Um, gave me lots of ideas of what I can do in the future, both for the day job and also for some of my personal endeavors with Shiny and, and just this ways of pr uh, improving infrastructure for these operations. And I would say my work on this app is definitely not done. We have a lot more to do in terms of keeping track of this data as it goes in so that when a user logs in and out of the app, they get the state-of-the-art information right off the bat. So we're looking at ways of hosting this data or somehow streaming it so that every person that logs in gets to see the up-to-date information and it's not like a fresh slate every time they log in. So we have a very active issue tracker that we will um, be looking at. I mean, both Charlotte and I are both very excited to continue working on this. So hopefully we'll cross paths and future commits and PRs. But um, it was, again, lots of fun to work on that. 
I think I'm hoping that um, Sam is able to leverage a lot of these as she's um, putting the finishing touches on the the uncoast on conference organizing. And that, like I mentioned, anybody in the future that wants to organize these events will hopefully have this great infrastructure to draw from. So lots of fun. It, com- it combines so many things that I'm passionate about and things I've learned along the years of trials and tribulations and successes with Shiny and, and, and R in general. So really happy I was able to be a part of that, but also learn so many cool things from the rest of the team there. So, in fact, I was so knee-deep in this, I unfortunately didn't have time to make the rounds to the other groups to kind of get their updates, but I do want to call out a few of them here in in the rest of my uh, summary for this episode. There's an awesome package that's been made by by John Blizzik um, called Workflow R. This is a really nice package to kind of automate some of the the tools or some of the processes that you might do to set up a project effectively in R. And he was able to get some great contributions um, from, in fact, they were probably first-time contributions, but they were quite valuable. Um, Ola Giwa and Jorge Argueta, and again, sorry if I'm mispronouncing names, um, they worked on an RStudio add-in to help you know, prototype a, 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 what we call a publishing portion of the workflow. When you're ready to share your work, on a different service or a different um, different website or something. So they're able to look at solutions for that. And then Ola also helped contribute a check to make sure that Pandoc, which is the um, utility that R Markdown uses to convert the actual R Markdown, I should say the Markdown text to HTML, um, they're able to build a check in there to make sure that that installation is available before the build function within the workflow R package actually executes. So really good stuff there. It's so exciting to see um, these first-time contributions and kind of the aha moments and the light bulbs going off in their heads of like, hey, this really works, or we finally solved this problem. So um, definitely an awesome package, and we'll have a link to that in in the show notes as well. So I I alluded to a little bit earlier, but um, back a couple episodes ago, I had a great pleasure of talking to Rich Ioni about a lot of the packages he's been working on at our studio. And one of them is the very, very promising and, in my opinion, very important package called GT to make tables in a tidy syntax, an intuitive syntax directly from R. So this reminds me of one of the projects at the, um, at the Oz Unconf in Australia where a group of participants wanted to make case studies, you know, tutorials about using the GG Animate package. And they did an awesome job with that. There was lots of great tutorials about it. But think of the same kind of idea for GT. So Florentia Mangini, and again, sorry, <laughs> I'm not pronouncing it right. Um, she created a very nice collection of examples using GT to produce a variety of tables. This is this could not have come at a better time for me because I'm trying to evaluate how GT can help us with some of the reporting things that we do at, at the day job, but also I just want to use GT more in my Shiny apps in the future. But she had worked through these examples, and Carl Broman, who was one of the mentors at the Young Conference, was able to really help her out with a lot of ideas. And... Thankfully, now they have a, a GitHub repo along with the uh, with the page all written in R Markdown to show these examples in action. So if you're new to GT, um, this will be a great kind of uh, blueprint for you to follow of different ways you can create uh, different types of tables. So again, really timely for me on a personal standpoint, but I think I want GT to be, you know, a very... Um, important package. It, it already is, in my opinion, but I want it to get adoption so that we can make it even better going forward. But the first step to that is actually finding ways of using it effectively. So really excited to see where that's going. And then Alex Hayes, again, one of the co-organizers of this con- on conference, he is the maintainer of the broom package. So he had a lot of great issues that were labeled for first-time contributors that people in the young conference could, could help with. And he had a good selection of updates and a good selection of closed issues to help make Broom even better. 
uh, broom itself, I think is really important in the tidyverse ecosystem, especially when you get to interpreting model results. So seeing broom get get even better is is nothing but good things for the rest of the community. So again, it goes to show you that these unconference events have a wide selection of different projects, and there's there's should be something for everybody. So I'm really glad to see that a lot of first time contributors are able to help. Uh, get some issues uh, closed away for Broom. And then the last one I'll mention is the Arlang Tip Project. This was led by David Smith. Um, David Smith is no stranger to the R community. He has maintained the Revolutions blog, which was honestly the first blog I ever saw about R when I started learning it in the way back era of 2005. And it has been very helpful for me to see what R was capable of. Well, I had not known this beforehand, and I frankly should have, but there was a Twitter account that was um, called Arlang Tip. It would tweet an R tip every day. It's been in, in use since 2011. Uh, uh, David inherited maintainership of this, of this Twitter bot from someone else. But what he wanted to do in this project was to kind of make it more modern and clean, clean it up the infrastructure a bit and, frankly, make it easy for those in the future to add more tips and, like I said, take advantage of the state-of-the-art technologies that we have that simply were not around when this bot was first created. So in terms of what this package does is now what, what that Twitter bot was doing it now actually prints this useful tip directly from R. So it, the, the best part of it is that you just run a function called rtip, and you'll get a random tip. Um, simple as that, folks. And, but there was a lot of fixing they had to do under the hood to take the, the, what looked like a pretty messy spreadsheet um, that they were dealing with for the Twitter bot and put that in a kind of a cloud infrastructure I believe now they're using Google Sheets for that. And then now somebody can download this package and be able to get one of these tips, you know, shown randomly. So I think this is a great, a, a great chance for people to get a little nudge to, be, um, to, to learn R and learn some useful tips along the way. So um, David was very happy with the progress. Um, they have a nice vignette on the package page that you can check out for more information. But... Um, our, our Lang tip is going to be a nice utility in the future, especially for those that want to, to up their skills of using R and they want something that's kind of given right in front of them, maybe it spurs a new idea or a new insight. So our Lang tip is another great project that's been enhanced because of this unconference. Well, that I believe that covers most of the projects. If I didn't get to one, I'm sorry, but those are the ones that I've I've, I've, I know I, I talked to a few people about to get, get some feedback on, but we'll have in the show notes a link to the unconference repository where you can get all the issues that were filed and, and you can kind of dive into what a lot of our contributors worked on. But so in terms of my overall experience, I think it was really great, a great unconference. Um, for my first time going to one of these, I think it was a perfect fit. And just learning from so many talented people and be able to share what I know, it's just been a gratifying experience. And it's great to see others who have maybe been struggling with similar is- issues as I have about how can we contribute to the community while trying to you know, balance a lot of other factors, but what are good places to start? Well, this was a great launching pad for myself and a lot of other people, I think, to get involved more and be able to really share our contributions, whether it's documentation fixes or making new tests or shiny apps or uh, anything else. I mean, all of this fits in a big picture of making R better. So I'd say if you have a chance to go to one of these, definitely take it if you can, because it's, it's such a different experience from the typical conferences, but it really gives you a chance to work side by side with really talented people. And I also want to give a shout out before I close this segment to uh, Joshua Goldberg. Um, he is a, is a data scientist um, in Chicago, and he he was so helpful 
not only to give answer questions for people, but he was on the ground taking some of the best pictures of events I've ever seen. Um, he has a photo album online. I'll have a link to his Google photo album of the unconference in the show notes, but he took some really awesome candid pictures and pictures of each team. So you can kind of see all of us working in action and, and get faces with a name. So um, Joshua, awesome job, man. And it's great to meet you again. And hopefully our, our paths cross in the future. But of course I have to thank the organizers, M, um, Angela, Emily, and Alex. They, went above and beyond to make everybody feel welcome. They were upfront about, you know, resources to help get questions answered. They had a great mix of mentors and first time contributors. So the full spectrum of experience levels were represented at this conference. And it was great to, to have people we could talk to, you know, such as the awesome Jim Hester from our studio. Um, I mentioned Carl Broman, very helpful. And, of course, Will was doing what he could to help with, with advice. Um, really a great mix of everybody. So I think well done. I hope they do it again next year. And if they do, I'll do my best to be there. Um, but you know, what an awesome experience. And like I said, if you can go to one of these, I would jump at the chance to do it for sure. So before we wrap up the episode, I want to kind of bring back a segment that we had done um, before the um, conference uh, episodes that we've had previously. And those are highlights kind of in the R community news. And I'm going to say this is powered by the awesome R weekly service. Um, I'm full disclosure. I am part of the team of curators for R weekly. And in this past release, I was uh, given the keys to put the release out. And the best part is I didn't make the machine crash. So <laughs> um, I was nervous about this <laughs> because I have never done stuff like this before where I've interacted with a Slack bot or curate links from APIs. And I was kind of nervous a little bit. But luckily, we have some awesome resources out there. And I think we got some great stories in, in this latest issue that went out on Monday as I record this. So... Um, the bigger news, of course, is that we have R3.5.3 that's now available. I would say it's mostly a bug fix release. I don't see any major new features here that have been called out. But as always, if you want to update, go right ahead and you'll be, of course, ready for whatever bug fixes were there. Um, there are uh, some minor ones that you'll have. You can read about the bug fixes in the post from, uh, from David Smith, actually, if you want to get more details on that, but it's always news and we have a new release about R. Um, the other stories I wanted to mention were that the R Consortium has now announced the projects that have, uh, have um, received funding for, for this year in 2019. And I'm very excited to see that two of my fellow R Weekly uh, curators are leaders of these projects. So Mael Salmon is leading a project called Catalyst of R Hub. So if you're asking yourself, what the heck is R Hub? <clears throat> well, that's um, a service that's been, uh, I should say it's a platform. It is a, a very comprehensive platform created by R Studio software engineer Gabor Sardi. And this was made before he joined R Studio. Um, but it's a great way for you to get your package tested with a variety of operating systems, a variety of R versions. And it's all automated. It's got its own API that you can use through the R Hub R package. But it's it's like I said, a very innovative platform. If I build packages in the future, I definitely want to use this to my advantage. Um, but now, what Mal is going to be doing with this project is get the word out, get resources out there for using it, and bring in feedback from those that are using it to make R Hub even better and make R Hub easily adoptable and and get them get it get get the word out there so to speak so i'm excited to see where that goes and i'm hopeful i can try our hub in some of my open source projects in the future but um that's certainly one of the projects and then colin fay who i've mentioned in previous episodes of his awesome work with shiny lately um, he's got a project for licensing guidelines in r and what this means is is that as, as most of you know, R is, of course, an open source, you know, you, it's open source pack or open source software. It's released under an open source license, I believe the GPL. The problem is, is that we have a lot of licenses in the open source community. 
if you're new to this, you probably wonder, well, which one should I pick? Is it MIT, GPL, LGPL, um, BSD, um, AGPL, Artistic? I mean, there's, there's a ton of them out there. And in the Linux community, this has been kind of a problem to figure out, okay, what software is licensed under which li- or is, is released under which license? And how do you choose which one that so that you don't have somebody, say, rip off your project entirely, but at the same time, make it easy for others to use your project. So um, Colin's going to be working on writing a set of guidelines. I believe he's already started kind of a, a, a book or a book down project with with some of his ideas so that we have a place to go to to get practical information on kind of like some guy, some points to consider for choosing these licenses. So I've listened to a few podcasts in the Linux community about license choice. And yeah, those have been helpful, but I do want something that's tailored more to the R user that's making a package or making an app or things like that, that something that they can go to and get reliable information. Um, so there's a lot more projects in besides these, and we'll have a link to the, to the full post in the show notes. But Again, I'm always gratified to see uh, my fellow curators get get some great projects or great ideas out there in the community. So check those out for sure. So I hope you've enjoyed hearing my um, summary of the Chicago R on Conference. And as I mentioned, coming up in a, a less than a month from now is the Uncoast Unconference, and I'm sure that's going to be an awesome experience too. So. Best of luck to Sam and also Ian Little, who's also one of the co-organizers. I hope everything goes smoothly for you all. Sorry I can't be there, but I'll be watching the GitHub repo and see what happens there. And I'm sure it's going to be a great experience. But but yeah, um, that is going to do it for episode 29. But if you want to leave your feedback about this episode, um, head to our website, r-podcast.org, and click the contact page, and you'll get all the links for sending your feedback we should be on all of the podcasting software out there for catching podcasts apple what was itunes music store whatever it's called um google play um, all or google music whatever it is um all the other ones so we, we should be there if not definitely let me know and i'll look into that um and then also like i said check out the past episodes and if you'd like to be a guest on the show and talk about your awesome work please get in touch i'm always happy to talk with everybody in the community about what awesome work they're doing so let's put a wrap on episode 29 of the art podcast and until next time end of line